What's up, party people? Thanks so much for joining us for another exciting installment of the Customer Success Skills Exchange. Today, we're going to be talking about deploying GitLab on Kubernetes and what to watch out for. Uh, Cristiano is here today to share with us uh, some information about Helm and Cube Control, or for those you know who like to call it Cube Cuddle. Uh, we'll be talking about installing it's GitLab. Not cuddle. There's no R. <laughs> Cube control. Look at the control key on your keyboard. I know. I was trying to make a joke. You're killing me, Smalls. They're, they actually do shirts. I think they were at Dev Nation last year that said Cube control. It's pronounced Cube Cuddle. I'm still trying to get one. <laughs> and then, uh, some GitLab default installation um, command line fun. And then we'll be talking about debugging. So without further ado, Cristiano, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. So I am going to share my screen. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone, for the feedback in the poll last day. So are you able to see my screen, hear my voice, and everything? Yes. Great. So today we will talk about uh, one of the two main installation methods for GitLab, uh, the Helm chart. We will go through the what a Helm is it, uh, the difference between Helm and Helm Control, the GitLab Helm chart, how to install, and all the parameters, and so on, till the debug session. So what is Helm? Helm helps you manage Kubernetes application. Helm chart helps you define, install, and upgrade even the most complex Kubernetes application. Basically, Helm is doing for Kubernetes what APT, RPM, Vue are doing for our workstation. They are taking care of the installation of a specific application and every dependencies related to that, including obviously the versioning. <clears throat> Kubernetes is including a lot of different resources pods, deployments, services, service account, token, config map, and a lot of other resources. And chart is including the definition for everything required from your application. So if I want to install, for instance, a web server, and I want to use just kube control, I will need to define all of these parameters by my own with a lot of different commands or manifests. With Elm, I can just uh, give the Helm chart name and obviously where it's located and just uh, the parameters and everything will be more or less transparent for me. <clears throat> can I use Helm instead of control or vice versa? No, they are different tool with different scope. You are going to use both of them. As mentioned, Elm um, for the entire application chart, Cube Control if you want to handle one specific resource. Let's uh, give a look to the GitLab Helm chart. The GitLab Helm chart, uh, uh, as mentioned, is one of our main supported installation. The chart is uh, stored at this repo. <clears throat> Here you have the chart. Now we are going to give it a look deeply. And the documentation regarding the installation is in our handbook, obviously. Uh, so really a, a quick look to the repo. Uh, what we can see from our, from our chart. The first part, the most interesting is obviously after the readme is the value. In every single chart, you will find this file is part of the mchart standardization. Inside the value file, you can find every single parameters that you can use for your HAM deployments, including the default settings for that parameters. For instance, if I want to install GitLab and I want to decide if I want the community edition or the enterprise edition, here I have my parameters with my link to the documentation and the default value for this parameter is enterprise. The value is really important, especially in complex M chart like our. We have a lot of application included inside GitLab, thanks to Prometheus, Grafana, Sidekick, uh, Nginx. Uh, and uh, from this list, we can easily understand uh, 
which are the capabilities of this M chart and which is not in the scope. For instance, I can manage the Postgres, I can manage the Redis, uh, I can uh, <clears throat> install, for instance, Grafana for my metrics or not. It's important also to consider that usually an M chart like this one is including a lot of external chart or resource that maybe pre-exist on your cluster. For instance, if I'm going to search for the set manager, we can see that uh, the installation by default is enabled. If I'm going to try the GitLab uh, chart installation on a cluster that, for instance, is connected to my GitLab.com uh, for other application, I will get a conflict because Search Manager is really installed from our GitLab Managed App, and GitLab will try to install the same things again, but I will get uh, a conflict at the resource. So, for instance, if I'm going to install this uh, cluster, this application and search manager is already uh, is already available there. I can just turn off these parameters, and this will not be included inside the GitLab chart. And I can use uh, what is already existing uh, <clears throat> in our cluster. The same, for instance, uh, for ingress. Maybe you know that every time you're going to install an ingress, you are getting a public IP addresses. And so the cloud provider is going to build you for this resource. If you already have a cluster that is already exposing <clears throat> an ingress controller, so you already have a public IP addresses, you, just, you need just to create <clears throat> the rule for the new application using the same IP addresses and you can save money and resource in this case. <clears throat> Same from Prometheus or every other resources. But going back to the slides. <clears throat> Our chart is actually including a lot of different components. Not everything is maintained by us. The core components are, as mentioned, the ingress, the registry for the container, Gitaly with the exporter and the <clears throat> GitLab Grafana, the shell, migration, sidekick, and web services. But we have also other pro other product inside. We have Postgres, we have Redis and Minio, and optionally, you can also install Prometheus Grafana runners or search manager to manage the SSL provisioning for the certificate. <clears throat> But it's important to understand that installing GitLab from uh, um, the Omnibus package installer and the uh, um, chart is not the same thing. For instance, there is some difference regarding the feature. Actually, GitLab page and the smart card authentication are not available for M chart. So choosing uh, the installation method is not just about uh, <clears throat> what uh, is in the customer uh, house regarding the infrastructure, but it's also about uh, which feature the customer is requesting. And for instance, uh, <clears throat> uh, we have also some limitation for customers that are approaching the geo functionalities. <clears throat> so let, let's give a look to what it means to install GitLab by Helm. Helm, like uh, a lot of other package manager, have uh, a repository list. You can add uh, the repo just with the common Helm repo add, in this case, GitLab and uh, our endpoint. And after that, uh, you use the common Helm repo update to fetch the last chart that are available that. I suggest you to make a repo update every time you're going to install something. It happened that a customer was raising uh, many tickets trying to make something working, but at the end, he was using just uh, an old chart that wasn't supporting the feature that he was looking for. And for the installation, actually, we just need to provide two parameters. I'm install GitLab and set the host domain and the set manager issue email. Obviously, if you are going to 
leave this enable it. But I wanted to give a look to the default installation. So if you have a blank Kubernetes cluster and you want to install GitLab uh, uh, out of the box, how it is, this is the only two parameters that we are going to use. About the domain, keep in mind that uh, if you give, for instance, uh, the domain uh, uh, <clears throat> example.com, you will receive back uh, three Full domain gitlab.example.com, mini.io.example.com, and um, <coughs> grafana.example.com. So, uh, is not asking for the final GitLab instance, is asking for the main domain, and uh, he will create the subdomain path. <coughs> But uh, in, th in this case, we use uh, the really two parameters. But if we think to anonymous installation, usually we have a long configuration file that lets you to manage everything. <clears throat> in Elm, we can use uh, the set flag like I did in the previous uh, uh, box. But as you can imagine, this is not the best uh, if you have to maintain the configuration, if you have a lot of configuration, or if you want to version the configuration. This is why usually we create an override file. The value <coughs> file is coming from default from the chart and uh, we already gave a look to that. You can just create another file with the same format and using this file as an override. So <coughs> looking at the same scenario mentioned before, I add my repo I installed GitLab and I use the parameter uh, minus F and I give the override file. So in that case, the override file was containing the original indentation and format coming from the <coughs> value and the, the value that I decided. <coughs> I can also retrieve the existing override I make some try with my command line. At the end, I find what I want regarding the parameters, but now I want to save them in a specific file and start my versioning. This is how I can retrieve the parameters. So I can take this, remove obviously the user supplied values line and save the content of the output as my new override file. And this is um, what I need to store uh, the existing configuration. If you want to retrieve information about uh, the whole application that is uh, up and running inside your cluster, you can add uh, get all instead get value. <clears throat> and you will retrieve also more information about uh, config map and everything related to that application. So I deployed my application. My application is up and running. I changed it that just as two parameters. Let's give a look to what has been deployed at the end. <clears throat> this is a list of the deployments that are up and running now. So I see the search manager to manage my SSL endpoint, the GitLab main component like runner, share, exporter, GitLab Minio, the ingress controller, the Prometheus server, so is installed by default, same for the registry and for the sidekick and the runner, and obviously the web server that we are using to reach our application. An important note about that is that the runner by default is installed, but is not privileged. So in a container cluster, you will not be able to use Docker in Docker. You have to change that parameters. Another important note that uh, you should give a look is that Sidekick is mentioning all uh, in one. <clears throat> if uh, we are talking about a really large installation, usually you are going to split Sidekick basing on the kind of the job that is executing. Uh, by default, our chart is not supporting that. It's just deploying a sidekick that we look at every single queue and try to pick just the first job. So if you want to make some customization, you need to uh, craft yourself the chart or the existing configuration. <clears throat> Autoscaling is supported Yes, it's supported, but not for every single component. Actually, it's supported for GitLab shell, for registry, 
for Sidekick and for the web server. Keep in mind that talking about the runners, you don't have to put an auto scaling on the first runner deployment. The first runner deployment, the first pod that you will see uh, running inside your cluster is not a real runner, it's just a listener. Inside that uh, uh, chart, there is a parameter called concurrent that lets you define how many runners that uh, a listener is able to spin at the same time. And a new pod, a new job will be executed for every single uh, request. Ah, uh, one, one note again about that. Uh, the autoscaler obviously is something that you can uh, set up. By default, you have a minimum pod at uh, two or one, depending from the component, and the maximum at 10. And uh, you have some specific target for the CPU consumption to understand when that pod needs to be scaled up or not. As you can see for GitLab Shell, for instance, uh, is uh, the number of the resource that is going to be consumed and for registry is a percentage. This is totally something that you can define deciding if the auto scaling have to be more aggressive or not. <clears throat> How many resources do I need to run a GitLab on Kubernetes? Obviously, I'm still talking about the default configuration. But if you have an existing cluster, as mentioned, a lot of resources could be already existing there. So you don't need to duplicate that. And at the same time, some servers that we are including could not fit your need or could be too big for your requirements. Uh, I made this installation on my cluster. And as you can see, it required five different nodes for a total consumption of uh, 18 giga and 20 CPU. Looking at the resource with the cube control top node command, I can see that for the memory, I'm consuming a lot of memory and I'm not uh, far away from the real consumption. And for CPU, I am in the opposite direction. I, I really using more CPU than what I need. So according to this, we can suppose that the default uh, ratio for consumption between CPU and RAM is one to two, and a starting cluster could have eight CPU and 16 giga of RAM. Obviously, after this, after the first spin up, everything is depending by the usage. This cluster is probably able to uh, support a small uh, team for the development, but it depends from the user, uh, from the usage base, if uh, we need to add more resources or not. This is just to have a starting point. So if uh, you have an eight giga cluster uh, looking at RAM, probably you will not be able to spin all the service that we require. Out of the bug, an Elm installation. Helm is supporting, like many other software, the debug flag that is giving you a more verbose output, but usually is clear enough let you, letting you understand what is wrong. After that, after that Helm uh, taken the deploy command, if you still have some trouble, you need to go back to kube control. Kube control is giving you the, the tool that you need to debug a Kubernetes installation. Kube control describe pod and kube control log is usually your best friend in a Kubernetes debug session. My suggestion is always to give a look to the liveness and properness check. Also in demo system, we see a lot of support requests where we are trying to find a problem inside Kubernetes, but uh, in reality, the pod is not exposing a service uh, in the expected port. And the described pod is giving you a, a report about the last liveness and problemness check. So you can give a look to that and understand if that part of your deployment is correct or not. 